So, um, so it should be very interactive. Ask questions, interrupt us, let us know. We have four things that we are going to dig into here, um, and then we'll leave it open for questions. So anything you guys want to ask questions about from a DSC perspective, let us know and we'll dig in. If we can do demos with the questions, we will. If not, we'll just answer the questions or what have you. Um, so we're going to talk about a lot of the new features in uh, WMF5. Um, so the encrypted mops we're going to dig into, um, what the purpose of those is, what the good things are, what the bad things are, all that kind of stuff. We're going to dig into configuration reuse. Um, nobody wants to write scripts the same stuff over and over and over and over again. So in DSC, there are a number of different ways to actually reuse configurations. So we'll kind of dig into those, what the good parts of it is, what the bad parts. Some are good for some things, and others are good for other things. Um, and then configuration status. Um, I, as Kevin pointed out earlier on, I came from the GP world. Um, so one of my big caveats or one of my big things that I have been pushing for since being on the DSC team was we're not going to build a black box from the PowerShell or from the um, GP perspective. <laughs> you had policy and what happened with the policy? No, no, no. Let's build a tool to figure out what happened with the policy. It's policy, so it should have applied, right? You don't know that. Um, so configuration status gives you a, a good look into what DSC did, what the status of it is, and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's actually a rich um, set of information in WMF5. So in WMF4, we had some basic information there. We've made that really robust, so it gives you a lot of information. And we'll show you how to dig into that and see all that information. And the last bit is the pull server too. There's been a, um, a lot of sessions already all day yesterday it was on DSC and pull server and all that kind of stuff. We'll touch on some stuff with that, especially as it um, kind of relates to um, DevOps and things like that. So we'll dig into that a little bit and some things there um, and then open it up for questions. So with that, I will hand it over to Travis to talk to you about the encrypted MOFs. Encrypted MOFs. So uh, we got a lot of feedback on previous versions that um, uh, it was difficult to use the certificates to encrypt the MOFs that you were sending to the target node. Um, so one of our goals here was to make it easier to make sure that your uh, MOFs on the target node were encrypted and secure. Um, but the total purpose here is to make sure they're encrypted um, in transit and at rest on the target node. So we have a couple of use cases, securing them off in transit. We have a documentation on that. Uh, there's a link in the notes. Uh, it's on our documentation on our, our documentation site. Um, so what's new here is there's a new requirement for uh, document encryption EKU. Um, and the provider for the certificate must be the Microsoft RSA um, S channel crypto, crypto, cryptographic provider. Um, That's a very important note because if how many people are using WMF4? How many people moved to WMF5? How many people got broken? There you go. So, um, yeah. so it's a good thing to know if you're moving from WMF4 because we did make a breaking change. Um, and that's how you fix it by creating the right kind of certificate. So the big feature here is that we automatically encrypt the entire MOF while at rest on the node once it gets there in WMF5. So is there a big advantage in that type of uh, certificate that made um, it? I'll let me uh, answer that. Uh, previously, it was possible to generate types of uh, certificates that had attack vectors on them. So if you had a certificate without the proper type of EKU, uh, you could use them in ways that would reveal their private, uh, well, their private, their public keys. This type of cert, if you generate it correctly and be in best practice, the public key shouldn't be given away, and you uh, shouldn't have the problem of a uh, potential attack against this cert. So this was done to increase the security of the encryption. Yeah, I assume that. I was just didn't know what this. I was just curious what the story was. Um, so, how does it work? LCM automatically encrypts the entire MOF using the Data Protection API on the target node. This means non-administrators cannot encrypt the MOF. Uh, that's 
no matter how you generated the MOF. Um, the MOF generated by PowerShell is not encrypted by default. So it's still recommended that you, you, if you're using credentials, to encrypt the MOF to protect it in transit um, so that your password is not <coughs> lying around in the MOF that you sent that you have lying around before you send it to the node. Um, so before we go to the demo, do we have any questions? Not. Uh, we have the demo here. Um, so first I'll show you the code. It should have come up. It popped up underneath. It's one of the things to point out here as well. We did this work so that we'll encrypt them off in place. Um, it doesn't prevent you from using the old methodology of encrypting the password. So when you use a certificate to encrypt the passwords, that still works, so you can do that, and then we'll encrypt them off on top of it. So if you really need that extra security of, I want my passwords hidden throughout the whole pipeline, you can still do that, and that works with this. So I guess, I guess that was my question. Is it necessary then if you're encrypting them off? I mean, I guess it really just did. So we've gotten feedback from customers that uh, there's other things other than the, the credentials that they may want to secure, like the location of some of the files they're copying from. Uh, so they may want to encrypt uh, the entire thing. Instead of may, we just encrypt the entire thing for you all the time. Yeah, no, I get that. My question was though the other way, right? If I'm encrypting my block, do I then do I still need to encrypt my password? You well, know, we, you'll see in the demo, um, but there are that the encryption only happens when the LCM receives it and then writes it to this. So there's other parts of the process where it's not encrypted. So the, the MOF created on the pull server itself, if you were using that mode, would remain in an unencrypted form, is that correct? That's correct. And even if you encrypt the passwords, it only encrypts the passwords. Anything else in your MOF generated by PowerShell is not encrypted. So like paths to your shares are not encrypted. And in Azure Automation DSC, if you're using that, um, it is encrypted um, on the service by itself. So when you generate the MOF, they encrypt it and then save it to disk. And when it's on disk, it's encrypted. And then they decrypt it, send it to the target node, and then it gets re-encrypted over there. That's exactly what I was going to ask. Next. Yeah. Does, that mean, does that mean you no longer need to set the plain text pack, password true variable under five, or is that still needed in order to... Um, that is still needed. Um, we are doing some work with Azure Automation to make it so you don't have to go there. Um, because they do encrypt it address. So I have a very simple um, uh, configuration. I have a meta configuration here that sets the thumbprint. I have the thumbprint already uh, in, in a global variable. The, uh, uh, then I, my, my configuration, I use XPS desired state and desired state, so I'm uh, 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 importing them. Then I create a user, and I uh, create a script where I'm not running as that user, and I'm going to verbose output the uh, name of that user, and then I'm going to run as the user that was just created and output the name of the user. And I have a function here to generate the configuration data, pass in the thumbprint so we're encrypted with the same thumbprint. Uh, I have a comment here that there's an alternative way to encrypt using a certificate file. I'm not going to use that or demo it, but um, um, that's true. And I'm also telling uh, DSC that I allow domain users. Um, this is a local user, but it's still We'll deal with that later. So I'll go ahead and import that module. I'm going to run the meta config, apply the meta config. This tells DSC to use the certificate to decrypt any MOFs that it uh, uses. Now let's go look at the meta config. Uh, and if you see here, I'm going to have to find it. Give me a second. Where is the here certificate ID? 
we have the certificate ID, we have everything else should be defaults. So um, uh, we'll move on unless there's any questions. The, now I'm gonna prompt for that password for that user we're creating. So strict, the password doesn't matter. So, uh, if you notice here, we're using a new type of encryption called CMS. There are commandlets for it. Um, the, and I'm using the password twice, so it's, it's in here twice. Uh, but as I said, everything else is unencrypted. All the code to get the user is unencrypted. Uh, so, we've already had questions about that, so just showing you that. Um, and then I'll run the configuration. And so we created the user. We ran not as the user, so D DSC runs as local system by default, and then we ran as a test user. Um, I'm going to go and get the user, get the configuration. I also, uh, so this basically just shows the same thing. When we do get, we're running as the same users. I'm gonna delete the user just so that uh, the user's not on the system. Now we can go look at the MOF. We don't see anything because it's all encrypted. And that's that demo. Any questions? To be fair, you could have just made that file by hitting your hand on the keyboard a bunch. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> hey, where's the fun in that? <laughs> oh, I think it was not moving. I don't think it's on the Then the challenge to you would be to deep. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, so I didn't ask this early on. Um, how many of you ha have been working with desired state configuration? Raise your hands. All right, about half the room maybe. Um, did, do you have a question? Yeah, I was curious, is there a place that we can go for documentation on how to do that cert, you know, if we're not familiar with any of that? The, uh, there was a link in the, uh, in the, deck. In the slide deck. Are we giving out the slide? Uh, yeah, if you can let me have them at the end, I'll make yep. sure they get posted. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm going to, we're going to be really short on time here. So I'm going to breeze through some of this stuff. I'm going to go over the configuration reuse. They're basically um, two use cases, I think, primary use cases for reuse. They're, there's reuse like functions. So I have a configuration. I'm going to do some stuff multiple times in that configuration. So I want to have a chunk of something that I don't have to write out a bunch of times with for loops in it and all this complicated logic. Um, so there's that use case, and then there's the other use case where I have a distributed environment. I have someone that knows SQL. They're creating a configuration that I want to use for my web app or IIS or whatever, where I'm not authoring that thing, but I want to reuse it so that I don't have to write the same code again. Um, so there are a couple of different ways that you can reuse configurations, and I'm sure there are way more than that, but these are two kind of, of the bigger ones, and I'll go through some examples of both of those. And the options that we have for um, configuration reuse or composite configurations, um, I, I don't know if we've done any documentation on this, um, but composite configurations are basically just using a configuration like a function. So in your script, you say, I have this configuration, and now I want to reuse that configuration in the configuration below that that I use. It's not packaging it up in any special way. There's no versioning or anything like that. It's just, I have this code. So a, a good example of that is, before we had the new um, uh, service set and those new resources that we put out there, if I wanna make sure that 20 of my services are turned off in DSC, I don't want to, well, for optimization purposes, I probably don't wanna have a big configuration that has service, 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 service. So I can create a function or a configuration that is above my other configuration that says, I have a for loop, I'm gonna pass in all of the resources that I want to, or all of the services I wanna shut off. It's gonna loop through those, create all of the individual resources, and then dump that out in the MOF. So you can create that above your configuration, and then call that within your configuration just like another resource. So it allows you to do stuff like that very easily. Um, 
There are partial configurations, which I think a lot of people will jump onto right away when they have a distributed environment that says, this guy's gonna configure my system this way, this guy's gonna configure my system that way, I wanna take those things and jam them together on the target node. There's a lot of good things about partial configurations, but there are a lot of, or there are other things that aren't so good about partial configurations, like partial configurations, you need to set the meta configuration and say, this is how my system's gonna look with these chunks of partial configuration. There's no versioning for partial configuration, it's just whatever, if my configuration changed, I'm gonna apply that. Um, and there's, what else with partial configs? Um, Thank you. That was my other point. Yes, the, the other thing is that, so it's gonna take all those configurations and doing DSC, it's gonna say, are there any conflicts with these configurations? But it's not gonna do it when you compile the scripts, it's gonna do it on the target node after it has all the configuration parts, parts. it's gonna jam them together and then go, something failed, fix it. And you have to figure out what that is. So that's uh, one of the negatives to that. One of the positives to it is I can be a security guy and I don't care who's out there. I want this configuration on that target node and I want it to apply. So um, it takes the, puts the power in someone's hands who needs to make sure that this configuration applies on that system. Um, and the last option is composite resources. It's very much like composite configurations except you bundle the thing up into a module and say, I wanna be able to share this with a bunch of different people. Um, so it looks just like a PowerShell module, just has resources in it that are able to be reused. You can have parameters that you can pass in and do the configuration and stuff like that. Um, one of the key things to know about composite resources is it looks and behaves very much like a resource, but it's different in that if you're using pull, those resources only need to live on the build server. They do not need to live anywhere else. You don't need to put them on the pull server. They do not need to be on the target node because they get exploded before the MOF is generated and turned into those underlying resources. And those underlying resources are what need to be on the pull server and on the target nodes. Um, so if you have logic in there that's trying to get information from the target node, it's not gonna work because that's never gonna be run on the target node. <coughs> All right, um, I have a quick demo here of the different examples. So right here I have a composite configuration. Can everyone see that okay? All right, I have a composite configuration. This is very much like the um, example that I mentioned. I have an IIS configuration up here, and then I have three other configurations for configuring web apps. I'm gonna do the exact same thing when I configure each of those web apps. When I'm gonna stand up IIS, I'm gonna open up a firewall port, so I create a configuration up above here that has a couple of, or a single parameter, that's a port parameter, um, and I'm gonna install, make sure the web server role is enabled, and I'm gonna open up a firewall port on that system. And then I can call this thing in each of these things just like another resource. So this configuration is IIS. That becomes the type like any other resource in here. So I'd say this type of resource is IIS. You know what it is because I defined it up above in this script. And I'm gonna give the unique name of basic to this thing and the one parameter that I have in that configuration is what I pass in as a property here and then do that configuration. So I can get each of these web apps configured very easily, cleanly, someone looks at this, they can know I'm standing up IIS on this system, I can name this thing whatever I want. Um, and I'm gonna open up port 80 on this one, I'm gonna open up port 880 on this one and then another port on the other one. So it gives you that reusability and when the MOF is created for each of these things, and I can show you that here real quickly um, in the composite config, the app one MOF, um, one of the things that, so a couple things here. Um, the name of the resource ID here gets jammed together. So when you create um, composite resources or composite configurations, in the MOF it generates the unique name for that resource by saying this is the type that I have colon, colon, and then this is, the, so basically it takes the, the name of the configuration and then the name of the configuration you're in and puts them together with colon, colon. So if you have multiple layers there, you'll know where that thing came from. So it gives you the ability, like in Azure Automation um, DSC, they're gonna be able to combine those things together in their porting so you can say, where'd my failure happen? And dig down into the individual resources from there. So it gives you that um, unique name for that. Um, and when you do a get status 
it'll have those names in there as well, so you don't have to dig into them off to see that. Um, but you get your configuration right there. Um, so the next one, real quickly, and again, if anyone has questions at any point, just yell. How many uh, levels deep can you go in this? Um, we don't limit how many levels deep you can go. Um, What's that? So it's getting pulled. It'll keep going. Do word do, do word wrap and then you'll be able to see where it is. <laughs> All right. So the next example here, real quickly, is the composite resource. Now you'll start to see kind of these are used in very much the same way as a composite configuration. But I said you bundle that thing up into a module, and this example right here is a module that I created. So. This is a Fabricam infrastructure, so I have common stuff that I want to use here. Um, I have a module directory. I have the module PSD1 here that defines the thing. Um, I have DSC resources inside of that. And with the new versioning and stuff like that, you'd have a version folder in here as well. So inside of the DSC resources, I have for each of my individual composite resources, I have a folder for that, and then I have a PSD1 for that, which doesn't do a whole lot, but that needs to be there to define that. And then I have a, a file which is just my logic. That is IIS, so it's a name of the resource, .schema.psm1. And then you have the same code in there that you would have in your um, configuration above that. So I have that for IIS, I have one for security, and then I have one for SQL. Um, I don't actually use the one for SQL in my example, but then I have my PSD1s here, so the difference that you'll see here is that I'm importing that new module, and then I can use that just like I could the composite configurations. So I have my IIS basic, pass in my port, and I'm good to go. So when I compile these things, you'll actually see that they look practically identical when you come down to the resources themselves. They have the same naming, so it squishes the two together. It says, here's my composite resource. I'm going to squish that name together with how it was used in my configuration. So you can uniquely identify that, and otherwise it looks exactly the same. Could you extend SQL just to see um, Yes, I can. So SQL. So I, go ahead. So one of the things that happens in here that is um, nice about composite resources or composite configurations is you can do logic in here. Like this one, I have a validation set and a version. So if you have different things that you want to do depending on the version of SQL you want to install, um, you can do that logic in here. And did I delete that? Oh, no. So I have a switch statement that says um, this is where I'm going to get the um, install for each of these different things, and then I just use that in here somewhere in the source, I think. So it's a source, and I use the source in here, so it's going to install it from a different place. So you can do that kind of logic in these things as well. Excuse me? Yeah. Um, it really depends. Um, I will show you an example after this demo real quick on some of the pluses and minuses to each one of them. Um, but it, it, it depends on your use case and how you want it to work. Um, what was this so question? The question was, um, in a distributed environment, which should you use, composite resources or composite or partial configurations? So, so. I have a quick question, sorry. So I find that using the PS desired state configuration and the XPS desired state configuration kind of confusing. Yes. They're not the same thing, right? Yes. No, well, they're not. Um, so it's like I think I'm putting on the new version, but I find that I have to call the, the old one because that's where the commandlets are, I guess, and I get the warning sometimes if okay. I don't. And so what's the difference, I guess? How do I? So the I idea with the XPS desired state configuration was um, essentially the things that we thought that we might pull back into the box, we would put in that. Uh, module, um, but that has not happened, and I don't know if it will happen. So, so should we call it something else? I mean, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a module. You can rename it and call it whatever you want, but not not to be flippant. But it's it's uh, um, potentially we there there are a few different things that we're looking into, um, and one of the things is should we open source all of the PSDSC and the stuff that's on the box? Should we just put that up on the gallery and let that be there? So it's, um, and if we did that, we would definitely squish the two together and, and make that one. But we are in, in 
general investigating naming of the models that are from the community and XPSC desire to make configuration is one from the community. Okay, All right. Um, Will what work with class base? Um, composite, yes, they will. The composite, composite resources are actually much simpler in class based. I probably should have had an example in here, but I don't. With the class based resources, you just use a class um, syntax, and then you can have multiple in one module. It actually simplifies it quite a bit. But then you can't do versions on the full server, right? For that's correct. Yeah. 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 Um, all right, so partial configs here real quickly. Um, so I have the same setup with partial configs. Um, when I run each of these, it's going to generate a MOF for each of them. And then basically on the target nodes, you have to come in and say, I have partial configs for each of these things. And in a case where you're pulling, in this case I'm pushing. So I've defined a partial or a a meta configuration that says I'm going to push each of these configurations to the target node. Um, you define the partial configs that are going to be on that box, give it a description, and then when you push the target or the partial config there, it'll get it, jam them together, and then apply it at that point. Um, so each of these will generate a single MOF, like you see here in my uh, partial directory. So it'll just generate a MOF for each of these. And then you send those to whatever machines should apply them. Go ahead. Will it wait until it has a configuration for every partial defined before it compiles and does the final jamming? Or if you only have two to submit right now and two are coming later, will it submit the two it has and then allow you to wait for those other ones? That is a very good question. The question was about um, how it applies partial configurations. Um, we allow you to define that in the meta configuration. So in the meta configuration, if you have this partial config depends on another partial config. And that's not tab completing, but if you have it depends on with another partial config, it'll wait till that other partial config gets there to apply it. And if not, it should just apply it. Well, it's not just gonna go, because you have to, well, with pulling it will, with pushing you push it and then you have to apply it, so. All right. Um, so now I will, I went through those, I'll jump back to my presentation here, and then you can see my fabulous uh, PowerPoint skills here at work. Um, so like I mentioned before, there's some pluses and minuses to both um, composite resources and partial configurations. And this is taking a look at what it looks like in kind of a, a DevOps environment where you're um, deploying to a pull server and you're going through dev, test, prod, and what have you. Um, in this example, I have the security SQL and IIS um, partial configurations and a web app that actually depends on those things to actually work. Um, and in a continuous integration deployment kind of environment, you go through and I, the security guy, create my partial configuration, I deploy it, it's out on the pull server. If there are any nodes that need it, aside from that depends on, they're gonna pull it down and start applying those things. Assuming you have depends on correctly done between all of these, it's gonna wait till it has all of them to apply them. So each of those partial configs go out to release. They're out there sitting on the pull server. I deploy my web application, it goes out there, the target node pulls it down, applies it, everything's happy, everything's good. And then my security guy comes along and says, I'm going to create version two of this thing. And this is a little misleading. Um, there are version numbers on this slide. Version numbers don't exist on partial configs like I mentioned before. So when you have dependencies and stuff like that, if you push a new version of this thing, the security, to your pull server, it's the client's going to say, is there a configuration that has changed with this? Yep. All right. I'm going to pull that thing down and apply it. So in this case, I go through my process of, or I, the security owner, say, I'm gonna go through my process of build, test, and release, and then push that thing out to the pull server. In the meantime, Mr. Web App 1 has never done any testing on that. So unless the security guy knows Web App 1, all of these things are above me, that depend on me, they're gonna get affected by this thing when I push that thing out to the pull server. So in this case, you're gonna have this Web App that has a new setting that's being applied that could affect it and you have no idea that that happened. 
So that's one of the things. And in some cases, if I'm the security guy, I don't care if I break web app one. If I have a security issue, I want that thing out there. Um, so there's some situations where you may want to do that kind of thing, but other situations where you're going to be like, whoa, I don't want to know about everybody in the world that's going to use my particular configuration here. Um, so that's where you get into the world where you have composite resources. So I have a composite resource, the same kind of situation. These three composite resources, I'm using them as the web app guy. So they are all in my web app. I'm using them. All things are good. That web app that I own, that I'm using those things, goes through the dev, test, prod. It's out there. Everything's working good. Then the security guy comes along and goes, I'm going to make this change to the security configuration. That doesn't affect my app at all. Nothing happened because this happens. These get pulled together at compile time. So when I'm ready to release my new version of my app, I do my new version of my app. It's reusing the new versions of those composite resources. I go through my test production and deploy that thing and everything's happy. So if you don't know about all of the up services that are making use of your, of your resources, then, then composite resources would kind of play into that a bit better. So there, there are different situations where you want to do the different things. Does that make sense? All right, I see some heads nodding. Other ones yawning and sleeping, but I apologize. <laughs> is, it, is it the plan to pick one patch moving forward? Or no, like I said, I think there are, there are good circumstances for using either one, like the security example for, as a good example, if you're the security guy, you want to make sure that settings are set a particular way, and if it breaks somebody, then they're going to come back to you and yell, and you're going to tell them what they're doing wrong. But if you determine that you need to support both of these methods in order to support those different scenarios, whereas you could recode and support all the scenarios of one each uh, Okay. Yep. Yes, it is. Put it on. Use your voice. OK. okay. Um, get configuration status, uh, get DSC configuration status. We had some feedback from the previous release that it wasn't easy to determine the status of previous uh, configuration runs. So um, uh, the purpose of this is to get the status of previous uh, configuration operations. Uh, a couple of use cases. If you call it with no parameters, it'll just uh, get the status of the last operation. You can add the all uh, flag and get the status of all logged operations. And um, you can add um, the sim session and get remote operations with the previous two combinations. I've also updated our public uh, module uh, XDSC diagnostics and provided access to historical verbose output. Uh, this is not a feature DSC provides, but the information is there and it works a significant percentage of the time. Um, <laughs> not, not going to make promises I had that, uh, um, that I can't live up to. It doesn't work all the time, but it's useful. So let me start my demo. So first I'll just show you the all. I'm, you can get that. It'll just show one without the all. So I've had several runs. Um, and the first one I'll get is I'll go get the first initial attempt and get it in a status object. And I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, so my first initial attempt was success with three resources. But there's more details in this status object, several rich objects. Um, I also, um, like you see here, there's many different types, uh, consistency, initial, reboot, uh, and local configuration. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'll go through a couple during the demo. But let's look at all the settings. Uh, we have meta configuration here, so each time it runs, we record what the meta configuration is, so you can go back and see uh, maybe it didn't run because some meta configuration was wrong. And we have the resources, this is a success, so we only have resources in desired state. Uh, so let's look at the rich object uh, meta configuration. And we have, uh, I was pushing to the machine, everything's pretty much the default state here. 
let's go look at those resources in the desired state. So I had uh, three things to hear. Um, the test user, don't run as, and the run as. This is the demo I did earlier for you. The, so let's look, we have a job ID. This is how we track uh, when you send us an operation, we track it by a job ID. So now I'm going to run that commandlet that I added and we'll get the details. So we have all the verbose output. This gets it from a, a JSON file. I ran it with... Question, Travis? Yeah? Yeah, I believe it's set in the meta config status, retention time, and days. Uh, it's cached. I'll get to it later in the demo on where it's cached. I believe I will, unless I removed it. The, <laughs> the, um, so I'll go through a reboot. We store this for reboot operations as well. Um, so. Uh, I didn't show you the status object, but the status object is pretty much the same. So we have the verbose for an operation that accounted as reboot. So this was something you couldn't get before. Um, and yeah, here, um, like this, the, all of this information is stored in this directory here under uh, system32 configuration, configuration status. We have moths that store this, what the inbox, um, um, commandlet is giving you and JSON files which store that verbose output. Um, and if you notice, not all the moths here have the verbose. So if they don't have uh, if they don't have the JSON file, we don't have the verbose output for those operations. Uh, so here's a failure just to get something interesting. Uh, we have resources not in desired state. So these objects are pretty rich. We have the exception details with stack traces, the full, the full serialization of the exception object. So you can go back and figure out why this failed, what line it failed on, uh, etc. Here I just did a, st uh, a uh, throw, so it's not that interesting. Um, and it was in a script, uh, script block, so it doesn't actually have the line number. But that's, that's configuration status. All right, um, so next, uh, I want to give you guys a choice here. Um, so next I have um, a few things with the V2 pull server. There are a bunch of sessions on the pull server, including all day yesterday and things like that that's going on. So I can talk about this. I, there is one thing that I want to show. Um, but if there are questions that you guys have that you guys want to ask and see how, how we can answer them, I'll do that. Otherwise, I'll, I'll go into this and kind of talk about that one thing that I want to talk about. Is there a question over here somewhere? Just one question. Yep. Uh, you mentioned uh, AADSC is going to encrypt any target. Are there any plans to move that into full server for our people who don't want to use AADSC? Um, potentially, um, but we have no commitment right now. <coughs> What's that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There is a user voice for that already, so yes. go, go plus one that if you want to. Yeah? So in version, in the version that comes with WMF5 and is with 2016, all of that data that um, Travis just showed you gets sent up to the pull server. Um, so that's one of the things that I'll show you here real quickly, but um, we don't do a good or we don't do a great job of giving you access to that data. It's all stored there. It's in the database, but we're not going to tell you how to get to it, but we, we kind of tell you how to get to it. Um, so. I will actually jump down. There, there are a bunch of questions here that we've heard from um, a bunch of different people, but I'm going to kind of, because of time, jump to my demo here real quickly. Um, so I'll touch on a couple things with the pull server here real quickly, just because they're here in my face. Um, so with the pull server, um, the best way to configure the pull server, as Jason and others have said, is use the resource. We have uh, X resource out there. Use that to, to do the configuration. Don't try to do it on your own, because it'll take forever. This resource makes it much easier, and Jason's script actually makes it even better and work better. Um, so use the configurations that are out there to do the configuration of the pull server. Your life will be a lot better. Um, 
the target nodes itself. The ones on GitHub, you're saying? What's that? The ones that are on GitHub? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and the ones that are on gallery. So as part of the XPS desired state configuration, there's a X web service, I think it's called. Um, use that to do the configuration of the pool server. Um, so one of the other things to keep in mind, if you're using the new functionality in the pool server where you can say, I don't want to use a configuration ID, I want to say this is the name of the configuration I want the target node to get. Um, the name is only used in this, is this the, this is the meta config. So you can in the meta config say this is the name that I want. That is only used at registration time. It's never used after that again. Whatever it, that node has registered with the server with will be used to say this is the configuration that the target node is get. The idea there is that you should be able to go to the pull server and say I want to change that and not have to touch the client. The client should just get the new configuration and apply that. Um, so the registration key, there may be a bug with that according to Travis. But the registration key, once registration is done, gets deleted. And if you put it back, that's the trigger to the LCM to say, I need to register again. So with the current implementation that we have, the way to actually change what's in the database on the pull server is to go to the node, put the registration key back in, and change what the configuration name is. And then it, that <coughs> node will register to get a different configuration. In Azure Automation, you don't need to do any of that. You don't need to have this configuration name at all. You can just have the registration key in here. It registers with Azure Automation DSC. And then in Azure Automation DSC, you can say, I want this system now to get this configuration or what have you, and it'll just get that configuration. So it, it makes that a bit easier. And if I have my way, we'll make that easier with the on-prem pool server as well. Um, yeah. um, so the next thing is, um, these resources here define where to go get the configuration. So this one is where to get the actual configuration. This one is where to get the resources. This one is where to report the status, all that rich status data. Um, you don't need this one. If you don't define this, wherever it gets the configurations, it's going to go try to get resources if it needs those. Um, you do need, although you shouldn't, you do need this one to tell it where to report. The idea with these is to give you the flexibility to say, I want to get configs from here, resources from here, and report over to there. Um, but right now, as it stands, the minimum that you need to configure pull is the configuration repository and the web repository, or the report web repository. Can you uh, expand the report and the resource real quick? Yeah, they look identical. So each of the places where you go to get resources and configurations and pull, you need to register if you're using the new registration or the new configuration name method. Um, and the thing that tells the LCM whether to use the configuration name or the configuration ID is the configuration ID. If you have the configuration ID set in the settings, it's going to use the old way of doing it. If you don't have it there, it's going to use the new way of doing it. Clear as mud? Is that part of the reason that configuration ID is required when you're doing partial configs in full mode? No, that's a bug. That's a different thing? Yes. <coughs> and I'm angry about that bug. Um, all right, so the next thing that I want to show you is I told you that the reporting is not exactly easy to get to, but we do provide a way of getting to the reporting data. Um, so I will cruise through here real quickly, but I basically what I have here is just a script that's going to go through um, how to access the APIs that we provide that give you access to the reporting data. It is not something that you're going to necessarily build tooling on top of, but it does give you the access to the reporting data. And the reason I say that it's not going to be something you're going to build tooling on top of is we have a key in the APIs that we call. That is the agent ID, which is essentially the um, the ID that is generated, either the configuration ID if you're using that method, or the um, agent ID that's generated by the LCM itself. And you have to pass that in to get the reporting data for that node. Um, so you basically, if you have a bunch of nodes, you have to iterate through each of those things with the, the known agent ID. Is and the reason, documented? excuse me? Is this documented? It is documented, yes. And I will put this, these scripts and stuff like that up on GitHub and share them. So. Um, so basically what I'm doing here is I created a couple of functions and those functions just basically allow me to parse the JSON that is returned. 
Um, so this pulls the generic JSON data out, and this pulls the status data out of that included um, JSON. Um, so I will make sure that these things are in memory here, and they're opening the doors now. All right, so I will run that. Oops, I need to do that over here. Um, so I will do that here. I will F8 that, that'll run, and then I will skip over these two. These two basically um, just pull up and show the schema for the pull server, so you can actually, if you know anything about OData, you can dig into that and figure out how to actually do the queries and stuff. And I'll just do a couple of the queries. You can get the node information about all the node that is configured on that system. So it's just an invoke web request, and we have the pull server, we have a nodes, Location, you give it the agent ID and then you get agent information and that'll pull the information about the agent. We have a configuration names and then the primary one is the reports, so you can pull the reports down for that node. So I'll actually jump to that so you can at least see that. Um, so a couple things here. Um, I'll run that guy. And you can see the reports that get generated um, from that. So this basically just took the last one and people are lining up already. Um, so this will take the last one. Basically, by default, we re return all of the reporting data for a node when you use this query. So if you have a month's worth of data, we're going to return it all when you call that. We give you a way through OData to filter that out. So you can say, I only want to get, in this particular case, I only want to get this high-level data without all of the bloat of all the reporting data. So I can dig through that and say, I care about this one job. So in this particular case, um, I have... Um, I get the data and I'm just getting these partic particular columns, so I'm not getting all of the big status data that um, Travis was showing you. I can figure out I care about this particular job, you get this job ID, and then you can call back into the API with that and get the rich data from that. So we do give you the tools to do it. It's a bit manual right now, but we do allow you to do that right now. So. I don't know that's a good question, and I will look into it, whether you can use the OData tools to actually generate commandments for this. So if there are any other questions, we'll be up here for a few minutes, but thank you very much.